And so welcome everyone. This session is how NIH processes and assigns your application. To be sure you're in the correct place, what we're going to be discussing here is the basis for assigning an application to an institute or a center, the basis for assigning an application to a study section, and a little bit about the timing and the process for application assignments. I'm Dr. Michelle Timmerman. I am an Associate Director at the Division of Receipt and Referral and CSR. And as I said, I'm the moderator today and I will be answering questions today. Our format today is a live presentation. Uh, this is not a recording, this is live. And that presentation will be given by Dr. Dwayne Price, who is the acting director of DRR. I'll answer a couple of questions in the middle, but most of our Q&A will be at the end. And I also have here with us my DRR colleagues, Charlie Lee and Dr. Sharon Gubanich. They are the ones who are going to be reading your questions in the Q&A and sending them on to me. So as you can see, we do have four live human beings who work at DRR and are on our presentation today. So with that, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Dr. Price. And Dr. Price, can you confirm that you see my slides again? I do, Michelle, thank you very much. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Dwayne Price. I am delighted to be representing the Division of Receipt and Referral at the Center for Scientific Review. Um, today, I'm gonna to talk a little about how the NIH processes and assigns the applications that you submit to us. Uh, next slide, please, Dr. Sherman. Thank you. Uh, before I start, I want to define a few key terms and acronyms. Um, you've probably already heard these uh, in the various talks this week, uh, but a little repetition doesn't hurt. As you may know, the NIH is made up of 27 different institutes and centers. I will refer to these as ICs. Uh, the Center for Scientific Review, or CSR, is one of the 27 ICs, and I'm representing a division within CSR, specifically the Division of Receipt and Referral, or just DRR. Grant applications submitted to the NIH are reviewed in scientific review groups or SRGs. Um, and just to confuse you a little, um, SRGs at CSR are also called study sections. Uh, each SRG is managed by the scientific review officer or SRO. And similar SRGs are housed in an integrated review group or an IRG. These are directed by an IRG chief. After the review, portfolios of similar grants are managed by the ICs by NIH program officers or POs. Next slide, thank you. So this schematic depicts the life cycle of an NIH grant from the time an idea is initiated to the time of award. I'm really only gonna focus on just a small part of the cycle um, indicated over there on the right in purple. Um, I'll talk a little bit about grant submission and I'll talk a lot about how we assign the applications. I'll stop just before the applications actually get to the scientific re review group. I wanna take a moment to emphasize the important role of the Authorized Organizational Representative, or AOR. Um, the principal investigator and the AOR work hand in hand throughout this cycle. Next slide. So moving on to business, um, you can submit your application electronically in one of three ways. Um, you can use a home-built system or a commercially available system-to-system -system solution. Um, you can use grants.gov workspace, or you can use the NIH's assist system, which is the one we recommend. Regardless of which system you use, once you submit your application, it takes the same path. It goes first to grants.gov, which does a few checks, like whether the funding opportunity announcement is open or not, and then it's retrieved by the NIH. The NIH does nearly 800 electronic checks and validations. These checks may result in the rejection of your application. But once the application passes the system validations, it comes through to the NIH ERA Commons, an online interface where grant applicants, grantees, and federal staff at the NIH can access and share the same information. Next slide, please. So it's, it's really important that your application be submitted on time. And on time means 5 p.m. local time. If you work in Hawaii, that means your application needs to come in at 5 p.m. Hawaii time. If, however, you're on vacation in Hawaii, which would be nice, um, but you actually work in New York, um, it needs to come in at 5 p.m. New York time. And that's because it's the time at the applicant organization that really counts. Um, we have a lot of standard due dates that repeat year after year after year. And sometimes they just happen to fall on a weekend or a holiday. 
standard due dates automatically roll forward to the next business day. So if your standard due date is on a Saturday this year, um, you have until Monday to submit your application. Again, because it's due at 5 p.m., the applicant application needs to be in the door at 5 p.m. Things that come in after 5 p.m. are considered to be late and are subject to our late policy, and we may not be able to accept them. Uh, next slide, please. So there is a two-day viewing window after your application is submitted. Um, this is a great opportunity to catch mistakes, but you need to be aware of two things. First, your application, follow it all the way through to the ERA Commons. Many applicants just push the button and walk away. Um, it's essential that you look at it. If you can't view it, it doesn't exist and we can't review it. So make sure you make sure there's an image associated with your application. Second, it's also your opportunity to make sure that your application is in shape for reviewers to consider it. Sometimes you look at it and you see you need to fix something. The system will hold your application for two business days after you submit to allow you to make changes. If you submit your application at least two days early, you'll have the full two-day viewing window to take advantage of. However, if you submit two hours before the deadline, then you only have two hours to work on it. All changes and corrections and updates must be made before that 5 p.m. deadline or your application's late. Next slide. However, um, we don't slam the door shut um, when the due date passes. Uh, we have to leave the two-day viewing window open across that deadline because we do take some applications late. If your application is late, you must include a cover letter explaining the problems that you had. In all cases, these problems must apply to one of the principal investigators or PIs. There are reasons that we would be able to take your application late. For example, there are federal computer systems issues. If you have review service by the PI or an acute illness of the PI or a family member, the guide notice listed at the bottom of the slide details the full policy. Please note, we don't give approval in advance and making a correction is not, is not, is not a valid reason for submitting late. Next slide, please. Once the application comes in to grants.gov pipeline and negotiates the two day viewing window, it ends up in the division of receipt and referral. Uh, we process all incoming applications for the NIH, but we also process applications for other operating divisions of the health and human services such as the CDC and the FDA. Of the NIH applications, about 25% are destined for review in one of the IC review shops. The remaining 75% are reviewed in the CSR study section. Since that's the most likely destination of your application, I'll focus on CSR review for the rest of the talk. Next slide, please. So the doctoral level scientists at the Division of Receipt and Referral have broad scientific backgrounds. There are eight full-time staff that do nothing but process applications, and there are 22 part-time referral officers. These are really full-time SROs, but they're basically doing two jobs at once. Um, referral officers assign your application to an institute or center, and they direct your application toward the appropriate scientific review group. We're all expert in the mission of the ICs, and we know which CSR study sections review what. And we're also very knowledgeable about NIH policies and as they relate to the receipt and referral of applications. Next slide, please. We make decisions based on a number of factors. For assignments to institutes and centers, we consider the scope of the IC's mission and their referral guidelines. We verify that the IC that we, review, that we would assign your application to participates in the Funding Opportunity Announcement, or FOA. And for review assignments, we look first for any agreements about the locus of review. Sometimes applications are reviewed at an institute or center, and so they would go there, not to CSR. And sometimes for special initiatives, we cluster applications during review at CSR. For applications destined for CSR study sections, we use the publicly available guidelines posted on the internet. Next slide. So changing topics a little bit, next slide. Let's talk about the IC assignment in more detail. The key thing here is that the IC that would take your application has got to be on the FOA in order for us to assign it. At the top of every FOA, there's a list called Components of Participating Organizations, and it lists all the institutes and centers that are able to take applications through that FOA. Every single round, every round, we get a lot of applications that are submitted to FOAs where the IC that would be appropriate for that application doesn't participate. Sometimes we can find an alternative FOA um, with similar due dates, but usually we can't, and usually we have to withdraw the application. So please, please, please um, take a look that list before you, you decide to use a particular FOA to submit your application. 
The only exception to this rule is if an IC has issued a notice of special interest that points to a FOA that the IC does not participate on. This is allowed, but it's rare and it's pretty onerous. In this case, it is essential that applicants include the notice number in the agency routing identifier field or box 4B of the SF424 R&R form. Next slide, please. So what, you know, if you're not sure which IC is appropriate for your application, well, the NIH has developed a tool to help you. It's called Matchmaker and it's in the online NIH reporter system. It uses a database of all funded grants. You just enter some text, could be your abstract or specific aims, and push the button. Next slide, please. Matchmaker output looks like this. The first column tells you which institute or center funded application similar to yours, and that's really important. It also lists applications and their abstracts. Next slide, please. The more important thing is that Matchmaker can also route you to a program officer. That's the person responsible for managing the programmatic, scientific, and or technical aspects of grants. We always highly recommend that applicants, particularly when they're not sure which IC is appropriate, reach out to a program officer. Matchmaker provides a list of potential POs with their contact information. So I'm gonna pause there for a moment, um, Dr. Timmerman, and uh, we can take some questions if you'd like. Great. Um... So out of respect for OER and um, their attention, making sure we stay on time, I am actually setting a timer to be sure we don't use a disproportionate amount at this. Um, so here's a qu good question. If you speak with the PO prior to submitting to a new application, should you indicate that in a cover letter and does that have any effect on the IC assignment? And bonus points to this person, they said for those FOAs that many ICs participate in, of course. Almost, not quite. So absolutely, if you speak to a program officer, you should note that uh, you had this conversation with the program officer. The place to put that, however, is not in the cover letter, it is in the assignment request form, I will call it ARF, sorry for the abbreviation, and you should put that in the rationale. And that is where we look for all of the information of, about the assignments that um, you want to be requesting. So are applications reviewed on a first come first serve basis? So I'm, I'm going to answer this question for application receipt and referral because application peer review is going to be different and talked about in many other cases. Um, application receipt and referral. So if you hashtag submit early, we created a hashtag for that. And let's say you submit a week early, we do not leave the application sitting there until the due date. We actually process it uh, according to our normal time frame, so if you submitted a week early, then there actually is the potential that you might be able to fix some issues, possibly. If you submit it two days early, then we get the application um, the day after that two-day viewing window on the actual due date. So they are reviewed as, a, as they are received um, in terms of the application receipt and referral. Do we recommend that the PI makes suggestions for specific study sections? That's actually going to be in the next talk. Um, does CSR consider the matches from the assignment referral tool? So we consider that in two cases. One is if an applicant enters under their rationale, I am requesting this particular study section, um, because it was in the assignment referral tool, that is something we will consider. You know, it's a valid consideration. We do not simply click a button and say, oh, the assignment referral tool said, this is the top one, so we will assign it to there. And I'm answering this question not only for the assignment referral tool with study section assignments, but also the IC matchmaker. Those are tools and they are very valid things for you to make recommendations on. We will consider those recommendations, but 
it is all evaluated by multiple doctoral level scientists. In no case is it somebody clicking a button and simply confirming an algorithm. Um, and with this, I'm going to actually turn it back to Dr. Price to go ahead and continue on. Excellent. Good questions, Dr. Timmerman. Thank you so much. Uh, so, uh, uh, so we are uh, changing topics here a little bit. Next slide. So let's talk about the review panel assignment in more detail. Um, and we had some questions about that. So good question. Um, again, 75% of the applications are reviewed at CSR. Um, the rough path is that they come into the division of receipt and referral, and our staff then pass them on to the chief of an integrated review group. That chief then makes a final decision about whether the application is appropriate for review in one of his or her study sections, and then makes the final assignment of the application. So you can see right there, there's two people already. It's not just a computer. Um, they use the same resources that you have access to. They use the guidelines that CSR is posted on the internet. They use Reporter. And as mentioned in the questions, um, they use an assisted referral tool called ART. Um, and I'll touch on ART again in a moment. Next slide, please. So you can get information about CSR study sections a couple of ways. Um, you can go straight to our website. Um, there you can browse the various categories and look at specific study sections and see if they're of interest to you and are appropriate for your science. Um, next slide, please. Um, as you may have noticed previously, you can also use Matchmaker um, on the NIH Reporter website. Um, and I think we're ahead one, Michelle. Um, so it, uh, yeah, there we go. Uh, However, Reporter only looks at funded applications and it includes study sections that are now defunct or retired. Um, now, next slide. So this is where we get to talk about art. Yeah, so for a more complete and up-to-date approach, you can use the assisted referral tool. Um, this works a lot like Matchmaker, um, but it's based on the universe of applications reviewed in study sections, not just the ones that were funded. And it only returns active study sections. As with Matchmaker, you just enter some text and push a button. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so ART suggests study sections that might be appropriate for your science. Um, they're categorized as either strong or possible. Uh, and note that the study sections are returned in alphabetical order um, so that the one at the top doesn't necessarily mean it's the strongest match. For this example, one of the strong matches was the Neural Basis of Psychopathology, Addictions, and Sleep Disorder Study Section, or NPOS. If you follow the links to NPOS, you're going to get a lot more information. Uh, next slide, please. For example, you're going to find out who the SRO is, along with his or her contact information. You can reach out to the SRO and get even more details, but the site actually provides the written guidelines for the review group. We use the same guidelines that we use in DRR for assigning the applications. Importantly, you can see who the reviewers are that served on that study section. You get a list of the appointed members and also the roster for the last three meetings. The roster lists the actual reviewers, including temporary reviewers, that participated in each specific meeting. Next slide, please. So after all that legwork, um, you might have some definite ideas about what you want. A particular IC looks better than another, and there's a couple of study sections that look pretty good too. So how do you convey this information to the division of receipt and referral? Well, um, you can use, as Michelle said, ART, I'm uh, sorry, ARF, the A-R-F, the Assignment Request Form. Um, you can also use this form to let us know if there's someone out there who has a conflict that shouldn't be reviewing your application, or you can even just give us the general categories of science that need to be covered for the review of your research. Uh, we try to honor your requests, but it is of paramount importance that your application ends up in a study section with the appropriate expertise. Next slide, please. However, you don't have to make a request. Um, the Division of Receipt and Referral knows how to route applications and add them together. Staff have nearly a century of experience doing referral. So you can just let us make the decision. Um, we're pretty good at this. Um, so now having talked about the SRG assignment, I'm gonna pause and we'll take some more questions. Dr. Timmerman. Okay. Um, and following up on ART, if I get a strong match from ART, should I specify that in the ARF form and will it be taken into account? So part one, should you specify that? Well, you know, follow the links, read the study section description. And if you think it is appropriate for your application, then absolutely feel free to list it on ARF 
and in the rationale explain this was a strong match on art. Your request and your rationale will absolutely be taken into account. Um, it's not necessarily simply going to be rubber stamped whatever you requested. If those are suggestions, they are not um, pre-matches or I don't quite know how to say what they're not. You know, they are suggestions. They are requests. They are not something that uh, the application must be assigned to if in the opinion of DRR and the IRG chief, ultimately there is a better study section. Um, is it possible to request a change of study section after the assignment? It is um, based on your rationale and you do need to act rather quickly because keep in mind, you know, there is a review time frame here and the very first thing is assignment to the study section. So if you see, look in your commons account, you will see a list of the SRO and their email address. The person you will actually be talking to after review, however, is their supervisor, the IRG chief. Now it's totally okay to send it to the SRO, that's the email address you have, and then you can just move forward um, communicating with the IRG chief. But briefly explain to them what expertise you think is lacking on that study section that is required to review your application. And that goes ahead and starts a dialogue there. And then I'll do one more question before finishing up. If I am doing a resubmission, is there anything that I should do to make sure my application goes to the same study section? Uh, and I'm assuming that this is a case where the study section is still in existence and is still reviewing the same topics of applications. Um, what you can do is on the assignment request form, list that study section, and then in the rationale list, they reviewed the A0 and this was a good fit. The SOP, if an application does not request a change in either the IC or the study section assignment as a resubmission, is to reassign them back to those original to those original assignments if they are still appropriate. So that is our default action, but you are absolutely welcome to go ahead and put on the ARF that yes, you do want this assigned back to the original study section. Uh, and Dr. Price, at this point, I'm going to turn it back to you. Excellent. Again, uh, thank you, Dr. Shimmerman. Great questions. Uh, we really appreciate the interactive nature of this uh, format. So thank you. Uh, we are in the home stretch here. Just a couple more slides, and then we'll open it up for any more questions that you might have. Um, so in addition to making the assignments, uh, we also look at policy compliance and DRR. Um, we're not able to screen every application from stem to stern because it would take us literally months to get the applications out for review. But we start that process. When we look at the electronic system, um, Think the electronic system itself looks at very binary things, like was the appropriate attachment included? Uh, in DRR, we looked at the text in the attachments, uh, things that the system can't check. Um, we also look for late applications, and we look at the font and format. Um, we don't want someone squishing their application down to six-point font just to get more text in there. Uh, we also look for what we call overstuffing, which is when people put excessive information into their application to maybe gain a competitive advantage. Um, we often discover unallowable material in the craziest places, um, the appendix, um, the other attachment section, human subject section, uh, you name it, so on. Uh, we also look for duplicate and overlapping applications. Uh, the NIH really wants to support great science, but we want to do it once, not twice or three times. Um, and finally, we look at unallowable resubmissions. Even though the NIH has had only a, a single resubmission for the past decade, um, there's some applicants out there that still go for that second resubmission. Um, applicants that are not compliant with NIH policy uh, may be withdrawn by the DRR. Next slide, please. So I think we jumped ahead one too many. Sorry, back one, I think. Yeah, there we go. Thank you. Oh, there, perfect. Yep. Um, so at the end of the receipt and referral process, what do you have? Um, you have an IC assignment. Um, you have a primary, and you may have one or more dual assignments. If there's multiple ICs that might be interested in, in your science. Uh, once the ICs have your application, um, they will assign a program officer. That ball is going to be rolling. 
Um, you'll have an application number as soon as the review chief clears his or her queue. Um, you'll have the study section assignment as soon as, and as soon as you have that, um, you're going to know who your SRO is. Um, all of this information is available on the ERA common status view page for your application. Most importantly, you're going to have the name and contact information for both the SRO and the PO. Um, as it's scheduled, uh, you will be provided with a review meeting date and time as well. Um, next slide, please. It bounces, doesn't it? Back one. <laughs> there we go. It is oh, a very go. eager slide deck. That's right. Yes, where they, uh, we want to finish up quickly here, I guess. Uh, so uh, sometimes during submission, you really need to talk to somebody. So who do you talk to and when? Uh, if you're trying to submit your application and you're, get, you're hitting errors and you're not even getting the application in, please, 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 uh, the first group you're going to have to talk to is the ERA Common Service Desk. Um, if they're not the right people to speak to, they're going to direct you to the right people. More importantly, though, um, if you're having a real federal system computer issue, um, they're going to be able to verify that for you and document it. And you'll need that because that's one reason uh, we can accept an application late, but you need that verification. Um, you can also reach out to the Division of Receipt and Referral if you have any questions. Um, we have a telephone number where you can talk to a real live human from 8 to 5 p.m. Eastern time and an email address that uh, you can use 24 7. Uh, Mr. Charlie Lee here with us today usually clears out those emails within the day. Um, the application um, has already been processed and is under review. Um, you have a couple of options. Um, if you have an administrative question uh, or process question, uh, probably your scientific review officer is going to be the better contact. If you have a scientific question, um, you will probably want to reach out to the program officer. Um, after the review, the SRO is done. Um, their job is finished, and you're going to want to talk to the PO. Uh, next slide, please. There we go. Just once that time. Uh, again, feel free to reach out to the Division of Receipt Referral at any point in this process. Um, we're always, always happy to help. Um, final slide. Uh, <laughs> Back one. Yep, there we go. Uh, finally, consider subscribing to the NIH Guide Listserv. Um, this is very important. Um, every Friday, you're going to get a summary of all the funding opportunity announcements, the notices, and other things that have been published during that week. Uh, you might find a new AFOA. Uh, you might find a policy change or a change in a requirement for a AFOA that you're already planning to use. Um, this is definitely worth your time, and it's really not too much of a burden. Um, it's a page usually of information, uh, and you can quickly scan it. Uh, Finally, finally, um, I want to thank you for your time and attention today. Um, and remember, we're here to help. Um, so don't ever hesitate to reach out. Um, we'll try to solve your problem and get you the information you need. Um, so again, thank you for your attention. We have a lot of great questions. Um, if we're not able to get to your question, and if you have a question that's specific to you, you know, rather than generalize for the whole group, I'm going to put our email address back up there, which you can see is indeed staffed by a real live person here. Um, there are a couple questions I'm going to answer about IC assignments. If you list a particular IC and it seems to be 50-50% between two ICs and it's assigned to the second one, is there a possibility to transfer it and how do we make that case? And a related question is, if you work closely with the program officer at one IC, is it possible that an application might be assigned to another IC? And this is under that general topic of what do you do if your application is of interest to multiple ICs? You'll be hearing this guidance a lot at this seminar. Reach out to your program officers before you submit your application. And the reason for that is that your application must be assigned to, accepted by, considered for funding by one individual ICs. Generally, two ICs do not come together and half fund parts of your application. So your application needs to be of particular interest to one single IC. So certainly when you do that, you know, submit on your ARF that you uh, explain that you've worked with a particular program officer, you know, and again, identify them by name, follow your assignments through into commons. You should see them within about two weeks. And if you see your application is not assigned to that IC, then I would suggest you reach back out to the ICs. Um, you certainly can contact DRR and we will forward your request along to our referral counterparts. 
but we find that applicants are the best advocates for their own research. So reach back out to the program officer that you had worked with and say, you know, hey, here's my application number. You can see it in the system. Looking at what I actually wrote, what I actually submitted, can my application be assigned to your IC? And they will know what to do, but I'll give you a term. It is referral liaison. That's the group that they will work with, or just the term referral will get them to the correct group. Um, do PARs have special review panels compared to say a PA or an RFA? And where would I see this in the FOA? So an RFA will always have a special emphasis panel. A PAR might or it might not, or a PAR could go to a particular study section, but all of the applications to that PAR are clustered together. Every FOA lists a peer review contact at the end, and what you should do there is just reach out to the peer review contact and ask, ask how it will be handled. Uh, those decisions are always tentative because it depends upon what applications are actually submitted, but that gives you a good idea of um, what our plans are at least. There's a new email address for CSR that is a general mailbox, but I can confirm that general mailbox that's being listed is staffed by a, you know, a real person. Um, and a follow-up question is, do I need to request an assignment to an IC or an assignment to a scientific review group? The answer for both of those is no, but with a but for the IC. You need to have done your research and known that your application can be assigned to one of the ICs that is on the FOA. So since you've done that homework, you might as well put it on. For a scientific review group, that is different. You know, what happens if your application isn't quite right for any of the study sections? Well, your application absolutely will not be withdrawn and the SRO that it is assigned to will make sure that your application receives a fair, timely and expert review. So many PIs certainly prefer to research this and make a suggestion, but if you, chose wrong to use a phrase, or if your application just doesn't fit one particular study section well, it absolutely will be reviewed. It will not be withdrawn for that reason. Now, if your application can't be assigned to an IC on the FOA, it, it will be withdrawn and we will all be very, very sad. So a happier question here. Um, if you are responding to a notice of special interest, sorry, I have to call them a NOCI, we're the federal government, we need to use our abbreviations. If you are responding to a NOCI, what is the best way to show that? There is only one way to show that, and that is on the cover page form, specifically in box 4B, not 4A, not 4C, 4B. And that is listed in every NOCI exactly where it needs to be. You can list that information everywhere else you could possibly imagine, but unless it is in box 4B, it does not count. Um, now, this isn't information that really is relevant to reviewers because this is only relevant to program and to receipt and referral staff. Um, one of the good ways that I can tell we're getting a lot of good questions is we're getting a lot of identical, a lot of very similar questions. And that is my alarm that we have five minutes left. Um, is it better to leave the review assignment to, is it better to leave the assignments to DRR? For an IC, you have to have done your homework. So, it's not much more effort to go ahead and to submit an ARF. For the scientific review group assignment, you know, this is where your uh, scientific mentors 
would talk about the importance of you know knowing your study section but that is not going to impact whether or not your application is accepted for review and so i really want to make that point because you know when it gets down to what if i can't do the platinum level cross every i dot you know cross every t dot every i you have to be sure that your application can be assigned to one of the institutes or centers that is on that on that FOA. Um, I, I love the courage of this question. Out of curiosity, how exactly does DRR make the assignment choice if there is no suggested SRG? Do you just use art or is it mostly from experience and knowledge of mission fit? Um, the training for this job, frankly, it is similar to getting a master's. Um, you know, all of our staff were extremely experienced within NIH before we started here. There is a large amount of information about the Institute and Center's referral guidelines and the study section's referral guidelines. And we are required and expected and we gladly do learn all of that information and you know use our doctoral level educations to read applications and make those assignments based on our based on our scientific expertise and then in the next step for example ICs are then responsible for reviewing their assignments so the program officer will review the applications assigned to them and make their opinions about whether or not the application is appropriate. And sometimes that can start a dialogue with DRR. Similarly, the IRG chief and SRO might start a dialogue with DRR. So that's why, although you will see your assignments typically within two weeks, they might be changing throughout, you know, quite a long time throughout the pre-review period because we do try to be flexible about that. Um, three minutes, two minutes late. So, um, wow, th this is going to be the last question. It's uh, high pressure here. Um, can you resubmit an application if the PAR expires before the next submission cycle? So whenever you submit an application, your application type, so new resubmission, renewal, revision, it must be listed on the FOA and there must be a due date for that application type. So it might be you submit under a PAR, but then the FOA expires and you would not be able to submit a resubmission the next cycle. There also are PARs and RFAs and even PAs that do not accept resubmissions. So it's really important to read the FOA carefully to be sure that your scientific information is matching up with some more of the administrative requirements of the, of the Institute. Okay, and, and this next question is a great one. I've been hoping to get it, so I'll do this as the one last. Does a dual IC mean that either institute could fund the application? Theoretically, yes. Um, will that happen? Probably not. A dual IC assignment primarily allows that dual IC to be aware of your application, to track your application, and golly, that's nice. Um, it is not a second chance at funding and do not expect that your application will be supported by the dual IC. When I say that technically it could, it is extremely rare and we would typically see that in cases where like there is some type of exigent public health crisis like golly, I don't know, oh, the COVID pandemic. That means ICs are looking at supporting things um, quickly, and so they are more open than to their dual IC assignments. But that's why having an IC listed as a dual IC does not really mean that they will actually consider you for funding. So I just wanted to thank everybody, and in particular, uh, thank Dr. Price for the presentation today that has, has been a 
Very, very nice session here. Um, if you have any questions, please visit the exhibit hall booths. If you have specific questions for yourself, please contact the DRR. And OER has also requested that you click on the session feedback button and complete the surveys. I will say having um, participated in regionals at the time, back before it was virtual, that we absolutely take those uh, survey feedbacks to heart. Thank you again, everybody, and have a great day.